a large portion of the message will be the negative side, but it will end with a positive, the negative side of a message that, again, the Spirit of the Lord said through his servant, only one in a hundred understand this subject that has to do with our eternal welfare. Now, this may be a church of the one in a hundred, or we may be among the 99. But even if we're one in a hundred, my brothers this morning, as he was sharing about how he learned welding, going through and looking at our own mistakes, I think we can always learn it better. Amen? Amen. Okay, so what I want to share is something, and I'm kind of deep into this study or getting deeper. Um, what was it that caused the leading brethren, and by the way, were our pioneers Bible students? I think it puts us to shame. They were Bible students, and yet, when this message came their way, what did they do with it? A large influential number. Could any of that be in us? And if it is, don't we want to know it? Because the remedy is beautiful. Beautiful. And it is the first step in the path of the just to understand these things. And so those of you that already understand it, have mercy on those of us that can grow in it. Amen? Okay. All right. Um, maybe if we could thank you. All right. Um, the first step in the path of righteousness. The Lord says that he will not fail. Oops. <laughs> but technology will. Okay, let's uh, look at our opening text one more time. Those of you that have a, a Bible, and I'm sure you all do. In Isaiah 42, verses 4 through 6, I'll just read it one more time. It says, He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, and he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and will hold thine hand. Isn't that good? Yes. He will call us in righteousness and lead us down the path of it, holding our hand if we will let him. Moving on. And will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. For a light of the Gentiles. Okay, are we back? Okay, now the same power that was in that call is also the creative power, isn't it? So this can create an experience in us if we receive it by faith. And that is the key to it all. The same Lord who called us in righteousness is the same Lord who will keep us and lead us by the hand. Now, Isaiah 42 mainly speaks of Jesus, doesn't it? But I also believe it speaks of the Lord working through his people that have a commission to do that very same thing. If you have a Bible, oops, you've got to perfect that again. If you have a Bible, open your Bible to Isaiah 42, verse 21. Let's look at that. What does it say that he will do with the law? Magnify. Magnify the law and make it honorable. Now, Jesus Christ did that, didn't he? Doesn't he want us to do that very same thing? Because how could we be a light for the Gentiles unless that was the experience that we're having? God wants us to have that experience, and he wants the Gentiles to see us have it, doesn't he? Amen. To glorify our Father which is in heaven. Now, I'm going to try to do this, but I have a feeling we're going to get things a little twisted up. But let's go and, and think about this. Now, remember, the Lord wants us to have this experience, and he gives us a commission to do the same thing. And so an example, I find, is in Saul, who later was named Paul. And open your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 26, verses 16 through 18. Thank you, Lord, for small favors. Okay, Acts chapter 26, and I've abbreviated a lot of the quotes that we're going to look at this morning, 
And it says, I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. To do what? To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive, what's that? forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. See, Paul had a direct introduction to Jesus on that road, didn't he? To Damascus. And he had to learn something. Before he could be a light to the Gentiles, before he could turn them from the power of Satan to God, he had to understand exactly what the gospel and righteousness was by experience, didn't he? So the Lord called Paul in righteousness on that road. The Lord calls us in righteousness on the road we're on. And so there's something that Paul had to learn before he could actually be this light. And I believe it's the thing that we need to learn. I believe it's the thing that the leaders needed to learn back then in 1888, but said, no, this is not the gospel. Now, we need to, somehow we lost a little color there. But we can still keep going. Okay. This is what it was that Paul, a proud Pharisee, who once believed that his righteousness was through the law, didn't he? Isn't that what made Pharisees proud? The way that they kept the law? Okay. Now, upon meeting Jesus Christ, he had to reevaluate his former life of a Pharisee whose righteousness was by the law. Am I putting down the law? I have no intention of doing so. Not at all. But it needs to be in its place. So Paul recognized something. In Philippians, he lays it out for us. To the letter to the Philippian church in chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, he says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, <laughs> blameless. Pardon me. In dragging out Christians to have them persecuted and beaten and maybe even killed, blameless. Was that the Lord's law? Huh. Was that the Lord's righteousness? But he was righteous according to the law of the scribes and the Pharisees, wasn't he? Wow. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And what did he count them? And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but of that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. This is what it is that we need to have before we can actually be a light to the Gentiles, before we can turn them from the power of Satan to God. Because was Paul living a life of godliness, of justification before this happened? No. He was serving Satan while he believed with all his heart he was serving God. Is it possible that if only one of a hundred can understand this, is it possible that in this day, when evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, when we're not the Bible students that our pioneers were, that we might be doing something similar? And so the Lord loves angry, bitter, bigoted Pharisees. And so he sends, he sends him a message to save us. Excuse me, I'm saying us, aren't I? Well, maybe it is us. What did Paul lose? He says, I counted it all but lost. What did Paul lose? Paul lost money. Paul lost position in the Sanhedrin. He lost pride. He lost recognition. He lost the respect of all those that met him in the streets. He lost his friends. He almost lost his physical life. If you were in the Sanhedrin, I think you had a wife. But he never talks of that. He lost every earthly thing that was any good to him at all. But he counted it but? Dung or refuse, some Bible versions say, but I kind of like mine. What do we feel about the things of this earth? 
When we're called to understand righteousness and we find something that's in our life that we like more, Paul loved his life, didn't he? He was excelling in everything it meant to be a Pharisee. But yet he says, my education, my attainments, everything that comes through the law, I count it but loss and refuse. <sighs> That's what he lost. Money, position, well, we've already went through that. But his glory had to be what? Exalted or laid in the dust? I believe we're going to find that this is the foundation, this is the first step in understanding Jesus Christ, our righteousness, and following in the path of the just. Uh, Paul even said this. What did he have his life? What was the first step? He says in Galatians 2, 20 and 21, he says, I am crucified with Christ. What then has happened to his life? Why not? It's dead. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the genuine article, isn't it? The faith of Jesus. Do we really keep the commandments of God by the power of the faith of Jesus? What's our identity? Hmm. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So everything that he was, he's just saying is vanity. Good is dead, better off dead. Amen? So that Christ can live in us. Let that be our situation in life. But I want to ask this question. Could what prompted the leaders to recognize Jesus Christ, the embodiment of righteousness, as he stood before them, could some of that same thing have been in our leaders when they said, no, we'll not have this version, your version, Jones Wagner, and you, Ellen White, your version of what righteousness is. And by the way, righteousness by faith, is that strong meat of the word or is that foundational? Foundational. Whoa, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Imagine that. Imagine that. The foundation of our church as far as humanity goes, the leaders, and we will excel no higher than our instruments of reformation, our pastors. Generally speaking, there are exceptions to the rule. I hope we're all a room full. Amen? Amen. We want to rise higher. So the Jewish leaders rejected him. What is it that keeps us from receiving him? Because if we truly are, I'm going to speak to the man in the mirror, if we truly are, those who have received the message, why is not the earth lightened with the glory? Wow, what could a few disciples do all across Jerusalem, Judea, and then Asia, and then onward? What could a few do? What can a few of us do if we truly have possession of the message? Now again, I'm looking at some of the negative things this morning. But, you know, when it comes to the real gospel and what truly constitutes righteousness and salvation, the church has been divided since 1888, and I don't know that it's any more united than it ever was before. I think that we're beyond out in the courtyard. <laughs> we're messed up. But let's look at what the Spirit of the Lord says. Through first selected messages... Page 360, there is not one in a hundred, not one in 100 who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject that is so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. When light begins to shine forth to make clear the plan of redemption to the people, what can we count on? The enemy works with a diligence that the light may be shut away from the hearts of men. He'll make us tired, He'll bring up anything that he possibly can to cause confusion. He might even make us busy in the work of the church. Isn't that possible? Hmm. The thought that the righteousness of Christ... Now, notice the year here. It was also printed... Oh, I don't have it up here. But it was printed 
again in Review and Herald, uh, September 3rd, 89. She's talking about this a year after the, uh, the Minneapolis Convention. Our general conference leaders and members and delegates were all there, and many of them, maybe not just many, probably most of them rejected it. Back to it. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, seemed a precious thought, unfortunately, to a precious few. Is that precious you? Today, I hope it is. Now, what is it that caused such opposition that it split the church? And it did split the church, didn't it? But you know what? Sometimes the church needs splitting. Just like the Lord said, who is on the Lord's side through his servant Moses? <laughs> Sometimes the church needs splitting. It's time to do something drastic. So, what is it? Now, understanding what it takes to be one in the hundred, that's what I want to share this morning. I want to come into a clearer understanding of it myself, but it says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 456, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man, where? In the dust. Not in the clouds, but in the dust. And doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. Now, a lot of us like that second part. Oh, good, Lord, do for me what I can't do for myself. But we don't like the glory of being laid in the dust. No, I'm kind of proud of myself. Well, if not outwardly, inwardly. Let's move on. So understanding what it takes to be in the one in the hundred uh, basically is the negative side of the message I want to look at. And this is the side that the leaders rejected. But again, what is it? But laying the glory of man in the dust. And Revelation, see, this is something that struck them. How long had it been since we got the light on the commandments of God, especially brought home to us in the Sabbath commandment? Just a few years. And so our identity... As the remnant church, we're the ones that keep the commandments of God. We're not like those other people who don't. Like all those other people who didn't move when Jesus moved into the... We're not like them. Hmm, good shot, Brother Moses. Maybe we are. But um, this seemed to strike this concept of righteousness by faith, which was brought, which Ellen White said was like the breath of heaven or something. I can't remember the exact words that she described it as. But I'll tell you what, you know, in my education in Adventism, some of my teachers said, oh, that is an inspiration, that's perspiration. When you're dealing with the 1888 message, and they said, stay away from it. Don't worry about them, just stick with the spirit of prophecy. Well, then I thought about that. Well, what has it done for you? Just, now, I'm not saying that there's something better than the spirit of prophecy, but if Ellen White said these brothers had the light on the subject, then wouldn't it behoove of us to look at that light? Amen. And so I'm going back through it again, making sure that I wasn't looking at this with the wrong glasses on. Because it's strongly possible that Dean Farrell can make a mistake. A terrible mistake. And miss out on what the Lord purchased for me. Wow. And what he did to purchase me. I don't want to miss that, do you? No, we don't want to miss that. Not for anything in the world. It's certainly not leadership positions, amen? Because isn't that what the, the original rejectors of Christ our righteousness did? They thought about our position. No. Everyone will be following this man. So here's these upstart ministers. Hmm. Could that be? Moving on. So here is something these upstart ministers did. Think of this. In 1888, these messengers come to you as they're coming to me, and they tell us that as far as adding up to righteousness and the judgment of God, all our church leadership work, all our work in counseling as elders and deacons and deaconesses, all our medical missionary work, all of our mission planning and church planning, even at our own expense. 
Think about this. All your pastoral evangelism, all your Bible work, everything, the countless books and tracts that you've handed out, millions in this place and millions in that, and I'm not putting anybody down or anything down, but think about it. It doesn't add up. This is not going to be your title to heaven. And they're saying, what? Now, if not in the front of the mind, in the back of the mind, we count these things as they counted them things, those things, excuse me, as righteousness, as something that the Lord's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But there is something that needs to be in the experience first. And this is the thing that was missing. Even your commandment keeping and the persecutions you suffer because of my word are not righteousness in and of themselves. In fact, depending on the motivation for doing these things, well, in the first place, in the best, look at what the Lord says. Ooh, we are off the charts here, aren't we? Open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 17, verses 9 and 10. Is there any way to bring this back home? It's yellow, but it'll be a good up there, I think. Ah, color's getting better. Okay, let's read this. Jesus is commenting on what it was the, the duty of these servants to do. And it says, does he thank that servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I trow, or I think not, in modern English. It says, so likewise, when you have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. You know, when you think of the commandments of God, this is the what duty of man? Whole duty of man. Is this something that's commendable? Not of any special commendation. The Lord says, if you love me, do this. So it is an act of love, isn't it? And God is love. And the law is a transcript of his character. But isn't it only natural for a child of God to return love to his father? So that should be the only natural thing. This is that seed of enmity. Praise God, it's been planted in us. We should water that every day. But I diverge. Let's move on. Now, wrongly motivated these things, which we do, they become what the Bible might term as filthy rags. It's kind of like the rich young ruler. Oh, all these things I have done for my youth up. But did he really? Did he really keep the commandments? Did, you know, looking at the two principles, did he have them in his life? Love for God and love for his neighbor as himself? No. He didn't, did he? So we need to think about our motivations for doing things. Now, how, again, an influential number of those who first heard this message, how they responded... It wasn't good, was it? Oh, by the way, that is supposed to look that way. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's kind of off to the right. Well, maybe we're right wing today, huh? <laughs> okay. So they responded as most do today because if they ever hear the message, because in the back of our mind, as I thought about earlier or spoke of, in the back of our mind or in the front of our mind, these things we consider are our righteousness. These are the things that qualify us as Seventh-day Adventists doing the thing that we're supposed to do. After all, you'll never be a, a minister after the gospel order until you take a decided interest in the medical missionary work. Amen? Well, I could go on with all this. But in Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 and 92, we shared this last time we came together. I just kind of want to do this as a review. But if we look at the condition of our church and the condition of the work that is being done with the message and what is really there in this description, where are we at today? And where have we been for such a long time? Are we in the most holy place or are we out wandering in the wilderness somewhere? It says, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. It presented justification through faith in the surety and invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. 
This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. To who? The world. To the Seventh-day Adventist church or the world? The world. Wow. It's got to happen here first, though, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Last time we got together, I asked somebody, what would you say if you were going to say this in two words? And the answer came, latter rain. Amen. Amen. Let's look at another one. Amen again, to Brother Glenn. Okay, the time of test. First selected message is 363. It's also found in seven Bible commentaries. <clears throat> 984. It says, the time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. What text does that remind you of in the book of Revelation? Revelation 18. Now, where is that in the frame of prophetic time? Isn't this connected with the sealing? Doesn't the sealing have to happen first before you can do this? Do you mean the Lord was actually starting the sealing back when? And then we said, uh uh, nah, not so fast. Oh, believe me, it hasn't been fast. We're going to leave the world in darkness a little while longer. Now, that wasn't the outward proclamation, but by the rejection, well, by the fruit, you'll know a thing, right? Lord, forgive us, but thank you for bringing the message home to us. Now, it came in with a controversial bang, but we seem to be carrying it on with a series of poofs. But it's going to be a flash that will lighten the earth with its glory when we really do get it. How many of you want to get it? How many of you want to keep it? Amen. Guess what? The original bringers of the message didn't keep it. We were talking about why on the way up here. The leading brethren will have something to answer for. One more thing. Let us not be answerable to the same. Now in 1888, he called our church in righteousness. Remember our opening text? He's calling his people in righteousness to be a witness like it was said through Paul and to be a light for the Gentiles and given for a covenant of the people and it was God's intention that through this experience and message that he would make a short work in the earth as it says in Romans 9 28 for he will finish the work and will cut it short in what in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth but it's been a long time. It's been a long time. How much longer will it be in my life because of me? How about you? I'm not trying to put you down. I just want us to question it. But Satan wants to distort this message. And he knows that if taught and received correctly, it's going to have a very specific effect in our life. And ultimately, on the life of the world, and hopefully it'll shorten the life of the world, if you understand what I mean. Amen. Hasten the day of the Lord's coming. Amen. But these are the effects. One, it excludes all the righteousness I wrongly thought entitled me to heaven. Remember, Paul counted it but loss and but dumb. Two, God's people will have an overcoming experience that will seal them. Actually, that could have been worded the other way around. To have an experience that will give them overcoming as well because, well, I think it goes both ways. Attended with the outpouring of his spirit, spirit in latter rain power and the third one, all the created world will see the long-awaited manifestation of the sons of God lighting the earth with the glory of God. Amen. All creation's groaning right now waiting for that manifestation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the mystery finished. Now, I just listed some texts. There are many more. You can probably think of your favorite ones. But number four, it will prepare us for the time of trouble, allowing God to make a short work in righteousness and hasten Jesus' return. Satan has to multiply counterfeits to keep us distracted. And so, as I pray in silence with this one word, duh, 
listening prayer, waiting for the Lord to speak to me. When I haven't been obedient to his word, I haven't received him in my life. Do you know a lot of people are absolutely swept up in Pentecostalism? Because this spirit that says it's God comes into them and gives them an overwhelming experience. You know, spiritual formation does the same thing, doesn't it? But there are all kinds of different, and, and by the way, doesn't the Lord want to come into you and give you an overwhelming experience? He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But the Lord says, wait a minute, I want to make you a sanctuary, and I want to dwell in you, and teach thee and instruct thee the way that thou shalt go, and guide you with mine eye. What experience do we want to have? I want that one. God wants us to have that one. Let's take it. Now imagine this. Picture the general conference leaders, the delegates, and the members hearing a message that exposed them as being a hindrance to the gospel itself. <laughs> Delaying Christ's coming. Can you imagine them? The faces that they must have had? Again, hearing a message that exposed their self-righteousness as a hindrance to the gospel, being humbled, acknowledging their sinfulness and spiritual pride, and admitting that they were deceived and were deceiving others. Can you imagine the leaders of your church doing that? Admitting it when somebody brings a message that just really ran across their feet. Wow. In humility, admitting it, how many people would do it? How many of us would stand up in front of everybody and say, I have been a hindrance? Probably not many. Because after all, we're in positions of leadership that people trust us. How could I do something like that and damage their trust? Ooh. And seeing that after all our years in Christianity that our faith and experience doesn't satisfy the biblical or heaven's requirement. That's intimidating, brothers and sisters, isn't it? Think about it. It's intimidating to have this pointed out to us. So let's look at kind of what that's like. Imagine a very well-paid, well-known Sunday preacher accepting the Seventh-day Sabbath and saying, you know what, I've been wrong all the time. You know what I mean? Look up any of these faces sometime, look up their name, in Google Images, and then look up house and see where they live. Wow. And Paul says he counted it but lost and dumb. <laughs> wow. Do you think that they're giving up any more than Paul gave up if they were going to do it? I don't think so. He not only gave up his friends, but they were hunting for him. They made a vow they wouldn't even eat until they killed him. Are we willing to give up something, a cherished idea for the Lord? I hope so. Now, Paul needed to recognize, it's like coming to know, by the way, when the light hits us, that these charges from God apply to us. As it is written, there is, in Romans 3, 10 and 11, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Do these charges apply to our leadership then? What about us? Could it? Does it apply to Christianity at large? And also, let's bring it home. Because, you know, truth that isn't worth applying in our life isn't worth even wasting our time with at all, is it? Think of it. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Now, why does the Lord say through his servants, be not deceived about a certain subject? Because there's going to be a massive deception on that very point, isn't there? Awake to righteousness. Wow. You know, when you look at that word awake, it, it's also a revive, but it means a, a, revive, a revive from the dead. When we don't have the knowledge of God personally, we're not really living, are we? What a counterfeit we trust. So Paul had to learn that he himself was unrighteous and unfit for God's kingdom. That's why he could write what he wrote, because he understood it for, his own, for himself. 
and he saw it in his pharisaical way that he thought he was serving God with all his heart and all his soul and all his strength. But he was all wrong. You know, we can think we're all right and be all wrong. So let's reevaluate and be that one in a hundred today. In Romans, see this, he dealt with these things himself, so he could write about them. Romans 10.3, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And Jesus was telling the people, to their own incredulous looks, I'm sure, that unless, in Matthew 5.20, we see it recorded, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. Wow. You mean we have to be more righteous than our examples? That's right. Not self-righteous. That's the whole point. How many of you have had to leave a church because you studied your way out of it? And now, did you love the people you had to leave behind? Sure, but we have to leave them behind because you know what happens when you surround yourself with a mixed multitude? Unless the Lord sends you to the mixed multitude, you become like them because the law of beholding is really a powerful thing. Be not deceived. But beholding the right thing is very powerful too. Amen. Now, here's something that we need to think about. If I believe that I have established some measure of righteousness on my own, will I see and accept my need of Christ? No, the congregation says. If I'm content with my own righteousness or any part of it, will I humble myself and truly seek righteousness from God? If I feel my work for the poor and my Sabbath keeping, my gospel preaching, gospel work, tithes and offerings that I return are good enough for me, how will I feel? Rich and increased with goods. I'm good. I'm good. Blind. <laughs> My brother says, poor, wretched, and naked. But I feel like I'm on top of the world. The Lord loves me. I'm his chosen. I'm the remnant. I keep his commandment. Do I? But I won't seek the righteousness of God, and that's the shame. In 1888 materials... I actually have a picture of the book over there, but it doesn't show through so good. 1888 materials, 814, 815. It says, the Lord has raised up Brother Jones and Wagner to proclaim a message to who? The to <laughs> I can't get over that. To proclaim a message to the world to prepare a people to stand in the day of God. The world is suffering the need of additional light to come to them upon the scriptures. Additional proclamation of the principles of purity, lowliness, faith, and the righteousness of Christ. This is the power of God unto salvation. In other words, the gospel Paul was not ashamed of, right? This is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Many will be moved and humbled. My question is, in this self-esteem driven, just do it world, how will a message of humility, of lowliness, of righteousness go? But the Lord says, take it, whether they hear or whether they forbear. But this is a message that will. Some will be moved. It says many. Well, in comparison over the many, we might see a large number, but in comparison with the world, but I don't want to argue with inspiration. But think of it. Oh, I had to look long and hard to find pictures that I could actually put up here in front of you. Why is it that magazines like Cosmo, like Vanity Fair, like Self, like me, like Ebony, why is it that these magazines are popular? Because that's right. They're self-centered. They're flattering messages. They're flattering ads. They're flattering articles. They really puff up me and puff up my esteem and, and show me how wonderful I really am. You know, there's Christian magazines that do similar things. People even seek a gospel that will do the same thing. But the Lord says, send them the real gospel, the power of salvation. 
And it says that God sent them to proclaim a message to the world to prepare a people to stand in the day of God. Without having to review that, that's the message to the world. And we bog it down in the church. We don't even live it. And so we can't proclaim it to the world. But apparently what I'm thinking is that self-esteem and pride and status was around in 1888 too, wasn't it? They wanted a message that flattered them for how good they were doing their commandments and how they were filling the church with numbers. After all, you started out with just 50. Look at you now. Wow, 18 million. How many of them understand by experience what this message means? I'm, I'm glad I'm not the judge. I've heard some people say there's 18 million of them that don't know. Well, I suspect that the Lord has some to do. But for all intents and purposes, just like Elijah said, I'm the only one. So the Lord sends a message that says that your focus on numbers and attainment leaves you destitute of the righteousness of Christ and spiritually bankrupt. So he says it to us, as he did to them. And generally speaking, if some upstart minister comes along and says something like that, I'll say, well, why are you criticizing me? Right? I'm as good as you and anybody else, aren't I? Maybe so. But I have the truth and follow it. I understand the prophecies better than most of those other people. I don't get caught up in any of these fad things. But I eat right, I dress right, I talk right, I preach right, I tithe right, I even double tithe. Yeah, they do. I keep the law, I keep the right Sabbath. I'm not like those Sunday keeping ministers. I'm not like them. I belong to the right church. I'm in the remnant. I'm good. I'm doing fine, aren't I? No. So if we could only see ourselves like God sees us. Let's read this from Christ Object Lessons. Page 159, no man can of himself understand his errors. And I had to abbreviate this. This is, oh, it's hard to cut any out. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. This is amazing here. The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to who? While speaking to God of poverty of the spirit, of spirit, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. Talk about deception. To the point of delusion. I've met that. And what scares me is, I could be that and not know it. When we contemplate, here's the cure. When we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness like every other sinner. Ouch. But the ouch is necessary. It's the first step. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish this work. That came up in class this morning. Author and finisher, can we trust him? Can we have confidence in this very thing that he which hath begun a good work will be faithful to complete it? Thank you, Lord. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made, at every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. Wow. Self-renunciation, the first step and every step. We need to take this with you. Take this with me everywhere I go. And, well, we'll look at Proverbs 4.18, but we know that verse, don't we? The path of the just. What does the word just mean? Righteous. Wow. We were looking at James 4.4 earlier, but let's look a couple of verses later. James 4, 6 through 10. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift thee up. 
lift you up. In Proverbs 4.18, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. That was pride. It was a lack of humility that caused the rejection originally when Jesus was there, caused the rejection again in 1888, causes the rejection since then to now in a larger number than we like to admit. But this is the first step. And you know what's a good step? It can be a stepping stone, isn't it? And we need to carry that stepping stone with us every way, all the way to the kingdom. I like to go on. Testimonies to ministers, 456. None but God can subdue the power, excuse me, subdue the pride of man's heart. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. I'd like to, you know, this quote may sound negative and even sarcastic. Yet in connection to the rejection of Christ's righteousness for man's own, the Lord's servant said this. I find this amazing. But it says, In the heavenly courts there will be no song sung to me that love myself and wash myself, redeem myself, unto me be glory and honor and blessing and praise. I found that quite interesting that that would, the prophet wrote that. But she was referring to this very situation, wasn't she? Testimonies to ministers, a large portion of that is dealing with that rejection and the cure to it. The keynote, it says, but this is the keynote of the song that is sung by many here in their, in their world. They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart, and they do not mean to know this if they can avoid it. I don't want anything that will confront me with that. The whole gospel is comprised in learning of Christ, his meekness and lowliness. How do we know that we've learned a lesson? When we carry it with us. When we carry it with us. So Jones and Wagner, they weren't afraid to use scriptures that were negative. They also used positive. We're going to look at the negative just for a minute, and then we're going to move on to something bright as we bring it to a close. They didn't avoid it. They used scripture that made leaders feel uncomfortable. Can anybody name any of those leaders? Very well thought of. Butler, Uriah Smith, uh, Conradi. Let's see. Whoa, was he influential in Europe? People won't even read the Spirit of Prophecy there because of his work. He was a rejecter, wasn't he? Uh, even one who's got most of his hymns, or a lot of our hymns, uh, Belden, he rejected it too, for a time. I think he came around. But anyway, um, they used scripture in a way that made the leaders feel uncomfortable. And let's look at a few. When I consider, in Psalm 8, 3 and 4, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? and the son of man that thou visitest him. I see negative and positive in there. He visited us. Psalm 146, 3 and 4. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. We were talking about that this morning, too. <laughs> we put our trust in leaders of amazing facts, amazing discoveries, or amazing anything, and sometimes they fall or fail right before our very eyes, and then we feel dejected. And oh, let's put not our trust in princes. Moving on. Psalm 39, verse 4 and 5. Lord, make me to know mine end in the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Be thou... Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man is at his best state is altogether vanity. They didn't like hearing stuff like this. Vanity. What is vanity? Useless. Empty. Yeah. Ineffectual. Now we're going to start turning right. Start turning positive. If we accept what it means that our righteousness is nothing, that God's righteousness is sufficiency. Amen? In him we live and move and have our being. Isaiah 40, 17. 
All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Not even vapor. Hmm. Okay, now let's get back into where it starts turning things around. John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. nothing. So here we see both. Again, if we abide in Christ. Did Wagner and Jones continually abide? We need to abide. And we can abide. The, the Lord, he doesn't reject a branch that's bearing fruit, does he? No. No. He won't cut it off. He might prune it. <laughs> that sometimes is uncomfortable. But again, we need to recognize this, that the preaching of justification by faith shows that God is everything and showed then, and by the way, this was rejected, that God is everything and man is nothing. <laughs> to carry that, the first step, and every step along the way heavenward with us is not that easy. It's a bigger pill than some want to swallow. But here we see it. The first step in the path of the just. Proverbs 4, 18 and 19. So we see the leadership, and we may see some time in our life, too, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness they know not at what they stumble. What was it that the leader stumbled at? Wasn't it light? Talking about that this morning, too. I was just saying to my brother, it's like you guys already preached my sermon in Sabbath school. <laughs> the ones that had the light here and then decided to go back out there, what were they stumbling at? Light. Well, that's a terrible condition to stumble at the light and say, oh, no, no more. I want to go back to the dark ages. Brother Ron. Okay, Brother Ron says in Patriarchs and Prophets it said that it's more damaging than what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, it's a greater sin. A greater sin, yeah, because there is no coming back. When you couple that with, uh, was that Hebrews 6, 4 through 6? When you crucify Christ afresh, when you have tasted of the heavenly gift and you know the powers of God, and then to turn from them? Wow. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. I believe it's also in Hebrews 10, 29, something similar. But to sin willfully. Let's move on. Now remember, what they were saying, now we don't have a direct transcript of what happened in 1888. Notice that? Why do you think that is? Why somebody threw a real wrench in the gears then, didn't he? And it worked. How sad. Encouragement for those who reject their own righteousness and seek God. So I was talking about negativity. They pointed out the things that we can't carry with us. They're not going to go heavenward. And so we need to have this. But also there was a, a remedy. To present the problems without a remedy is to run the people off, isn't it? Okay, let's look at it. And I, I've been reading this book and I really recommend it. The Everlasting Covenant by Wagner. Um, this is in the... Uh, in the 08 version of the Spirit of Prophecy disc in the Pioneer section, because it's a little different than the pagination here. But it says, he, now by the way, this is encouragement for somebody, has anybody here ever felt, <sighs> ever felt that you were worthless? Because of a sinful life, you've gone into despondency, maybe even depression, and felt like God couldn't accept you? This is for you. And this is for the people you're going to meet because every one of us, I think, at some point comes to this. And maybe you need a lift today. This message is for you. He that is afraid that God will not accept him. He thinks that he is too insignificant for God to notice and that it would make no difference to anybody, not even to God, if he were lost. We felt that way. Why, your worthiness or unworthiness has nothing whatever to do with the matter. The Lord says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember thy sins. Why does he do it? 
Not because we're so valuable, but because his word stands on it. Watch what he says here. And I had to abbreviate this, but could have just read this today. For his own sake, yes, certainly because of his great love wherewith he loved us, he has placed himself under bonds to do it. He swore by himself to save all that come to him through Jesus Christ. And he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Think of it. God swore by himself, that is, he pledged himself and his own existence to our salvation in Jesus Christ. He put himself in pawn, his life for ours. If we are lost while trusting him, his honor is at stake. It is not a question of whether or not you are insignificant and of little or no worth. He himself says that we are less than nothing. He says that we have sold ourselves for naught which shows our true value, but we are redeemed without money, even by the precious blood of Christ. Hallelujah. The blood, amen, hallelujah. The blood of Christ is the life of Christ, and the life of Christ bestowed upon us makes us partakers of his word. See, this is where self-esteem is so askew. We, we need to have Christ-centered esteem. Because what Christ has done for me from the foundation of the world and what he continues to do for me, and what he'll do to save me to the uttermost that come to him by faith. Moving on. The only question is, can God afford to break or to forget his oath? You see, why did God swear by himself? See, men swear by something higher, and that's to end all contention over the matter. But God couldn't swear by anyone higher than himself, so he swore by himself. And when he made that oath, he made it to Abraham, who had already proven the point that his faith was it doesn't matter what it looks like. When he put that knife to Isaac's throat, he had already proven himself, so the oath was for us. The oath was for us. And we, the seed of Abraham, who have the faith of Abraham, which is the faith of Jesus. Because Abraham saw his day and rejoiced, didn't he? Amen. Amen. This is beautiful. When you think about this, and think about what it is, as each party receives what the Lord paid for. You understand what I'm saying? As the Lord receives us, we receive him. Think about what this means what this redemption purchases. Our value as part in ending the great controversy is inestimable. Just like the, the value of Christ's sacrifice. Do you know that the great controversy cannot end until the Lord has a people on earth? A people on earth who magnify the law and make it honorable because God calls us in righteousness and he wants his righteousness called into us and he's saying, let me in I want to make a short work of this in righteousness. Do you want that? Yeah. Is there anything more that we can learn from this? Can we be that one in a hundred? Let's be it. By God's grace, let's be it. Isaiah chapter 42. I'm just going to read the first and last of our opening text. He shall not fail nor be discouraged. Think about how long we've made him wait. He's not discouraged till he has set judgment in the earth and the isles wait for his law. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. I will hold thine hand. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people. What in the world does that mean? As evidence of the covenant of God to man that he will save us. Amen? And save them. Reach down into the darkest pit to pick up any of us who will be. Let's stick up our hand and take his. He says that, and give thee for a covenant. He will hold our hand. He will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. What a privilege it is to accept the negative side of the message and get rid of all those encumbrances, all that that we should count but loss that we may win Christ, that we may win the world. 
The negative side can be a stepping stone in the path of the just. I'd like to read one more and then we'll bring it home with this. Think about this, when the strife is ended, and there's going to be strife, but the Lord has given us a message that will prepare us to stand in the great day of the Lord's return, and also that troublesome time that comes just ahead of it. But think of it when the whole battle is finished. It says in Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2, and we're going to end it with this. It says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. What does the Lord want to give us? Though we've been sinful? But he's saying, speak ye comfortably to her. Her warfare is finished. When we are finished with trying to be righteousness in and of ourselves, we accept the purchase price of him who was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our warfare is finished. It's as good as done. There's going to be a number. And it's not just the one in a hundred. Is it you? Is this what you want? Is it God's will? And this is a confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. So how many of you want to come before the Lord this morning and say, Lord, thank you for calling me in righteousness. I'm going to answer the call and by your grace. Accept. How many would like to do that? Well, let's come before the Lord.